So let me begin by introducing to you our first speaker this morning, who is Professor Niall Keane, who is Senior Lecturer and Chair of the Philosophy Department at the University of Limerick, and who, among other things, is currently working on a book on the transformation of the self in the Beiträge to Philosophie. And this morning he will speak to us on the topic of metaphysics, politics, nihilism in Heidegger and Jünger. Can you hear me? Do I even need this? Good? Okay. Um, I'll start by thanking Joseph and Raphael for the invitation. I'm very honored to be here. It's a um, uh, the title of the paper it has, it has emerged, and I, and I must confess that um, it has changed a bit. Uh, during the writing, which is which is to be understood, um, uh, the title of the paper, as I said, is "Metaphysics, Politics, and Nihilism." Or as Nicholas said, um, uh, and let me just uh, take off immediately uh, any plans or thoughts that you might have with regard to that. In an epigraph found at the beginning of Gesamtes Gaba 94, Heidegger refers to a passage from Plato's Theaetetus, which reads as follows: In Greek, he says, "Panta gar tolemeteon." which could be translated as everything must be risked. This is perhaps a fitting maxim for defining Heidegger's more esoteric works. And the recently published Schwarze Hefte fits squarely into this category, even if, in my opinion, they are less philosophical than the other texts of the same period. In terms of risking everything in the name of a complete transformation in thinking, Heidegger often speaks of the need to endure and to, to carry a type of onerous silence what Lyotard sardonically referred to as un silence de plume. Nonetheless, Heidegger continues to claim that the thinking to come, thinking reserved for a few genuine believers, his phrase, is necessarily meager and errant, and that these, few rare, uh, these rare few must hold themselves out into the darkness of necessity. They must have the courage, he writes, to endure essential questioning. It is thus no accident that his works in the 1930s frequently, all too frequently, reject the possibility of a simple clarification, which is nowhere more pronounced than when he writes in the Beiträge zu Philosophie that philosophy's vain attempts to make itself comprehensible, broadly comprehensible, is tantamount to philosophy taking its own life. Given this, one could very well imagine Heidegger's contempt towards the reception of the recently published Schwarze Hefte, towards the sensationalism that surrounds their publication, and even towards the well-made judgments that many of us have passed and will pass while the ink is still drying. One could imagine Heidegger referring to the arbitrary and leveling omniscience of public opinion, to the superiority of the liberal demand to open everything up to public discussion and to polarizing polemic. For instance, in Überlegungen um, 8 of the Schwarze Hefte, Heidegger states that real philosophy is not even in the business of, refu of refutation and can be judged, as he writes, on the basis of the human being's insistence in the truth of being only. Thus, in a certain way, Emmanuel Fay is correct to say of the 1933 Nature, History, and State Seminar, for instance, that the principles of philosophy traditionally understood have been abolished. And yet, hammering everything out in public, going to the texts themselves, and adjudicating on them calmly, sensibly, and philosophically is surely the only way to proceed in light of some of the more shuddering claims made by Heidegger, all in the name of what Travni has called an Seinsgeschichte, an anti-Semitism. After all, a paralyzing fealty or orthodox devotion to a thinker's self-interpretation no longer makes sense, even if this thinker, by way of an editorial self-staging, um, wants his works to be understood as vega nicht werke. Hence, echoing Aristotle, Aristotle's ethics, for the philosopher it is more important to honor truth above admiration or friendship. Thus, in an attempt to steer a middle course between polemic and fealty, for neither does much to illustrate a critical interrogation of a philosopher's thought model, and ultimately causes an irreconcilable impasse to be reached between polemic and fealty. Yet before adjudicating on, that, on this truth which is to be honored above friendship or admiration, one needs a foothold, a way in, if you will, and I would like to use Heidegger's encounter with Ernst Jünger on the nature of metaphysics and the possibility of, of overcoming nihilism as an instructive way into the general debate that, hood, that could help to frame, although not justify, some of Heidegger's more problematic claims. I have chosen to examine Jünger's thought because he is someone Heidegger learned much from, albeit negatively, concerning the impossibility 
of overcoming nihilism in metaphysics, concerning the unrestricted power of machination and the gigantic, not to mention someone who Heidegger engaged with throughout his writings of the Schwarze Hefte and the self-confessed great mistake of the Rectorat. It should be noted, however, that while Heidegger, that while Heidegger was influenced by Junger, Junger was only somewhat interested in Heidegger's thought and in fact confessed that he knew little about phenomenology and even less about being in time. In fact, it was Junger's brother who was more interested in Heidegger's philosophy than Junger. This notwithstanding, while Hulderlin and Nietzsche are the main figures engaged with in the mid-1930s and 40s, it is Junger who brings these interlocutors together. It is my suspicion that the influence of Junger who Heidegger defines in 1939 as the only genuine successor to Nietzsche, um, is all over the pages of Gesamtausgabe 94, 95, 96, which are contemporaneous with Heidegger's 20-year engagement with Junger, published in 2004 as Gesamtausgabe 90. Moreover, one could well imagine Junger being equally contemptuous of the recent reception of the Schwarze Hefte. These two calls so are these so-called conservative revolutionaries shared an elective affinity when it came to their mutual disdain for sterile publicness, for parliamentary democracy, for unheroic bourgeois liberalism, and more ambiguously, they shared a contempt for the definition of a people based purely on race as a biological criteria. To make matters worse, it is now clear that both were at best ambiguous about Judaism and the issue of assimilation. Neither could be described as pluralist. Both appealed to Jewish stereotypes, and both spoke at length about the unique historical destiny of the German people. And thus it could be said that there was more than a hint of cultural anti-Semitism at work in their respective thought models. That said, I believe it is mistaken to claim that a methodical anti-Semitism determined the trajectory and content of their thought. For instance, much like Karl Schmitt, Junger was interested in Judaism only insofar as it offered him an alternative account to Christianity in general and Catholicism in particular in the battle to interpret history in a new sense, history between friend and enemy, which Heidegger also refers to sporadically in the 1930s. And even if Heidegger succumbed to vulgar anti-Semitic anti stereotypes, we know them by now, skillfulness and tenacious skillfulness in calculating, obsession with serviceability, empty rationality, huckstering and scheming, his interest in Judaism, much like his far more widespread critical references to English Bolshevism, Americanism, Christianity, Catholicism in particular, communism, liberalism, atheism, paganism, culture, civilization, and by 1938, National Socialism itself, is rooted in his obsession with the history of metaphysics and its expressions of power, calculation, instrumental domination, machination, and object. Heidegger's thinking subsequently amounts to what he terms in the Schwarze Hefte, the broadening of Dasein into a meta-politics of a historical people. A thinking that prepares for another beginning by thinking against everything and seeing everything as the enemy within, namely the enemy of quantification and calculation. In this way, Arendt is correct. Heidegger epitomizes a certain way of being a philosopher in the political realm, which is rooted in what she calls the Feinseligkeit of philosophy to politics. Similar to Junger, and under the influence of Schelling, perhaps Heidegger's later claim is that National Socialism, uh, as a miscarried barbaric principle, which is not to say as a barbaric movement, it must be said, betrayed the essential possibility of a transition to another inception, betrayed the deeper possibility of the historical institution of a people, mainly due to its biological commodification of the human being, and ultimately Due to its intoxication with technology, it turned the human being into a pure subjectum, into both an instrument and an object of calculative assessment. For example, in the 1938 work Besinnung, Heidegger um, condemns the appeal to destiny, Schicksal, in Nazi Germany as the arming, Waffenstreckung, of beings' abandonment of beings, or the, as he says, the empty victory of the, hero the heroism of man lacking completely in decision. However, in the Schwarze Hefte, Dasein appears no longer to designate the human situation or uh, hermeneutic situation, pure and simple, but rather the task of its immeasurable transformation, which is not a mere revolution, it must be said, of what it means to think and what it means to be. Heidegger defines this transformative happening presciently in the summer semester of 1933 as the difficult 
the coming of a dark future. Therefore, for Heidegger, this immeasurable transformation must not only be politically revolutionary, but primarily and absolutely transformative. Discussing the National Socialist Revolution, Heidegger states the following in Überlegungen 7 of the Schwarze Hefte from 1938-39, quote, We know that a mere revolution among entities without a transformation of being no longer creates history, originary history, but rather hardens or petrifies the objectively present. Or as he puts it six years earlier in Überlegungen and Winke uh, 3, we must bring philosophy to an end, and in so doing, prepare for the fully other metapolitics. My hypothesis here today is that Junger is of fundamental significance for Heidegger, mainly because his engagement with Junger enabled him to see that the other inception of thinking presupposes the irrevocable renunciation of the volitional attitude and of all talk of overcoming metaphysics, all in the name of a metapolitics of historical people, which does, it must be said, in turn, lay the ground for a political revolution. It's just the order has, uh, has been put um, back to front. The fact that Heidegger's reflections on nihilism were elaborated in dialogue with Junger is not merely accidental. What's more interesting is how this dialogue allowed Heidegger to confront the naivety of his own language of overcoming found in Junger's work, found in his own work and in Junger's work. The question that emerges over the course of the dialogue is how it is possible to reflect on nihilism from within nihilism. From the beginning of the discussion, it is clear that neither Heidegger nor Junger believed that nihilism can become conscious of itself by means of a volitional self-suspension. Rather, what is put forward by Heidegger mainly is the possibility of an indirect glimpse of nihilism from within nihilism. The responses of Heidegger and Junger follow two different, albeit analogous, trajectories. For Junger, the response is that of a symptomatic anamnesis, which can be addressed by way of a diagnostic explication. To define nihilism, one must, for Junger, move from one way of understanding nihilism and towards a description of the genesis of the pathology, which amounts to overcoming it by viewing it as a normal and normalized condition. Here, Junger favors the corruption of an order of health for the sake of a creative transformation into a new vital state. Some of the most interesting, I must confess, aspects of Junger's descriptions hinge on the diagnosis of nihilism in terms of a normality that is completely ordered and organized. Nihilism is no longer associated for Junger with uh, the disorderliness of a degenerative reason or a degenerate reason, but with the health of the strong body that gives style to its own movement. Not an unproblematic claim. For Junger, the response to nihilism entails the habituate, habituated comportment of an impassable interiority as the condition of a free response to nihilism. In this sense, Junger embodies his self-defined anarch, the sovereign protagonist found in the late, no the late novel Oymesville, who is no mere proponent of anarchism or individualism, but rather a free and self-regulated anarchic self, defined by commitment, patience, solitude, and eventually by 1970, um, expressing and indifference to power, ideology, and party politics. Thus, for Junger, the most evident symptom of nihilism in a world is its self-presentation as a world increasingly re reduced to its function. This functionality, he claims, is imposing its global dominance in the accelerated form of the mobilizing and mobilized nature of labor, what Junger calls in 1930 the totale mobile mass which emerges as the simple, the symbol of the worker's form. Spiritually, says Junger, even if not yet materially, we are arriving at the line or the limit, or have perhaps already crossed it. Yet at bottom, Junger, Junger's hope is to establish a new vision that takes its start from a lack that cannot be filled in or expunged, and which can be experienced only through what he terms the productive force of pain or suffering. Junger likens this response to marching in the desert in the hope of finding new wellsprings from which to drink. Such wellsprings can enable the human being to reconquer what Junger calls an anarchic wild earth or wilderness, wilderness. Heidegger uses the same term in relation to, in the 30s, in relation to, to Hulderlin, which is the condition of our free redemption from nihilism. Yet if there is redemption, 
exactly who or what is redeemed. For Junger, and perhaps for Heidegger too, although it must be said to a lesser degree, it is only those select few who are strong enough to endure the productive force of pain, and thus a cosmological heroism emerges in Junger's thought, whether it emerges in Heidegger's thought is to be, needs to be argued. Junger broaches the question of redemption only, only to accentuate the need to reflect on the ontological question, and in so doing, transform the nothing, he says, into an original determination of beings. Thus, crossing the line comes down to a fundamental devotion, suvendung, to the ontological question. This seems to be more of a promise than a prognosis, in my opinion, in which hope can be nourished and in which these oases can be cultivated and not swallowed up by the vast expanse of desert. As such, the blind power of the nothing is to be transformed into something, within Jünger's system anyway, like the grace of being experienced cosmically, whatever that might mean, as what saves us from nihil. Nonetheless, the precise nature of the us remains problematic and is surely bound up with his reconceiving or their reconceiving of the national. What Heidegger, um, when Heidegger interprets Jünger's über die Linie, he starts with a reflection on the preposition, as most of us know, über, and assesses the risks involved in Jünger's diagnostic and medical language. Contrary to Jünger's crossing the line, Heidegger's main concern is with the line itself. He claims against Jünger that nihilism cannot be overcome and that the question of nihilism must be brought back to the ontological question and to the Western metaphysical delineation of being, nothing, and the human being. Therefore, while, Jünger, uh, while for Jünger the meaning of such a question lies in its preparing the way for a move beyond nihilism, for Heidegger it appears to be more about a transformative return or getting into nihilism. What emerges from his engagement, Heidegger's that is, with Jünger, is the realization that there is little we can do about nihilism per se, but what matters is how we assume a stance with regard to it. In this sense, Heidegger remained a phenomenologist. Yet against Jünger's descriptive topography of the line, Heidegger offers a topology of the line, and Jünger's proposed overcoming of nihilism is transformed into what Heidegger calls a freeing recovery from nihilism without moving beyond it. It is arguable that the failure of the rectorat is at play here. This is um, excuse me, the philosophical horizon of this um, claim is that being is withdrawing in seeing and is such in order to render entities intelligible and because of this for Heidegger being is no thing in its withdrawing. This no thing is not an empty nothing, as most of us would know, but in fact belongs to the essence of being itself, hence the need to put into question, uh, the, hence the need to put the question of the nothing at the center of his analysis um, and examine the essence of nihilism as a metaphysical problem. It is here that Heidegger makes the most decisive, and to my mind, the most problematic move by claiming that the nihilistic nothing is the nothing of metaphysics. Yet this metaphysical nothing, at the same time, contains, according to Heidegger, contains within itself a more pre-metaphysical relation to being, in which being, as crossed out, is given as a retracting openness that makes a claim on the human being. The essence of nihilism is thus precisely this withdrawing of being, such that this self-retracting is occluded, and this occlusion neglected, the double forgetting is still at work even with this. Therefore, this new devotion to being that Jünger outlined is also possible for Heidegger, although not by going beyond metaphysics, but by returning to it. Returning here would mean moving towards the self-occluding openness from which metaphysics itself emerges. Thus, the possibility of recovering from metaphysics, and by extension recovering from nihilism, lies in what Heidegger calls, ambiguously, I, have, I don't really know what he means by it, a commemoration that tries to correspond to, to the forgetting of the open no thing. It is hence no longer a thing called being, which does this activity called retracting or withdrawing, as if it could choose to do otherwise, 
but rather the withdrawing is being, and as such, being and nothing are said to be dasselbe. In this back and forth between being and nothing, Heidegger is attempting to push up against the language of metaphysics, I think, eh, in light of the political failure. At the culmination of metaphysics and nihilism, the ascendancy of the technological places a demand on the human being, we are told, to, to recognize the essence of nihilism from within nihilism. This recognition of nihilism amounts to recognizing the oscillation, this Gegenschwung he talks about in, in contributions, between being, the human being, and the nothing. Yet for Heidegger, Jünger's fundamental position is modern and metaphysical because it remains trapped in the gestalt of the human being as the subject that sets in place and produces the world and in so doing secures further production possibilities for itself. For Heidegger, Jünger, much like the National Socialist failure itself, is a failure to attune itself to a barbaric principle. So Jünger's failure is a, a failure to interrogate the opening of things in what they are, and which is in essence what Heidegger means when he talks about letting be as an originary praxis. So this failure to attune itself to the barbaric principle is a failure to interrogate the opening up of things in the, um, in the, uh, in the difference of what they are. To be critical now, it is perhaps necessary to ask ourselves whether Heidegger's reconception of being in nothing as the same, whether the uncovering of the so-called forgetting, forgetting by means of the originary praxis of letting be, is not itself a genuine expression of metaphysical thinking, motivating many of the exasperated claims made in the Schwarze Hefte. I would like to ask you and the other panel, uh, members of the panel whether metaphysics, which cannot be overcome, uh, whether metaphysics, which greed is, cannot be overcome, is necessarily operative in Heidegger's own attempts um, to find a way to think otherwise, and in his attempts to sketch this thinking otherwise. If we cannot find a way out of nihilism by means of the volitional attitude, if we don't even believe it is necessary to find a way out because no way out exists, then surely metaphysics becomes an inexorable determination, inexorable determination of the human being and by extension a necessary determination of Heidegger's attempts to recover from it. And if for Jünger the possibility of overcoming nihilism depends on a heroic and impassable cosmic voluntarism, for Heidegger it resides in the pure thinkability of being as a measureless and powerless no-thing, as the openness that allows what is to be distinguished from what is not, and as such to become intelligible in the open. In a word, in my reading, Heidegger is struggling desperately struggling to radicalize the ontological question by way of an essential nihilism that both enacts itself and necessarily exasperates itself in the Schwarze Hefte. Building on what I have said hitherto, even if both are connected, I believe we must take Heidegger on where he is philosophically strongest, that is, in his critique of the history of metaphysics, and not only where he is philosophically weakest in his vulgar anti-Semitic remarks, although the two are connected. Along these lines, I would claim that Heidegger's anti-Semitic remarks, his reflections on nihilism, and his critique of the history of metaphysics do form a constellation that is far from problematic, mainly because Heidegger aims to confront metaphysical actuality and by doing so bring about a revolution, as he said, more revolutionary than anything hitherto. For this reason, he claims in Gesamte Ausgabe 69, which I think is a fundamentally important text, but perhaps more important than the Schwarze Hefte, philosophically speaking, he claims that no political revolution is revolutionary enough. And yet, this claim from 1939 is bound up with a historically, historically telling um, reconception of possibility being nothing, understood outside the Herrschaft, Macht, Gewalt, Kraft constellation. Sentiments that do not exactly fit or flange with some of the polemic language of enemy and attack found in the Schwarze Hefte and in the 1933 Sein und Wahrheit. Um, clearly, this is bound up with Heidegger's claims in Überwindung uh, der Metaphysik that the Verwindung of metaphysics is understood as a withdrawal from struggle for power, which remains in the service of power understood as unconditional 
domination, Persia. Therefore, if the possibility of another beginning demands a transformation which is free from the language of power, free from the language of mastery, force, and free from the language of enemy, by way, a re by way of a rethinking of being, nothing, and actuality, then it is because existing actuality, structured by metaphysical thinking, impedes the enactment of this more primordial transformative possibility that contains, I would like to claim, that contains within itself the seeds of its own failure. Yet how did Heidegger, who claimed in 1935 that philosophy is essentially untimely, commit himself to a political movement that was mobilized and rooted in its time? A movement that promised a forceful revolution that was utterly disinterested in whether being and nothing are the same. This remains the interpretive challenge that becomes even more acute with the publication of the Schwarze Heft. This notwithstanding, while, Heidegger, while neither Heidegger nor Junger were fans of liberal democracy or open discussion, while both were allergic to open admissions of guilt, there is perhaps a real danger of turning our critical interpretation of Heidegger's Schwarze Hefte into a delirious bacterial spore hunting. While the passages referring to Judaism and world Jewry found in the Schwarze Hefte are problematic and blameworthy and connected to his philosophy, we must refrain from becoming what I would like to call bacterial spore hunters who, on locating certain spores, see thousands of new spores emerge. This would be, in my opinion, unphilosophical and would amount to a violent and monochromatic interpretation of Heidegger's middle and later works. And yet, we are left with a problem, and I, I would say, and following the recent um, exemplary and extensive work done by Donatella di Cesare, one cannot sidestep the hard problem that Heidegger clearly draws a philosophical parallel between Geschichtslosigkeit, Weltlosigkeit, and Weltjudentum. And because of this, he classifies Judaism as a form of life which is unable to interrogate the Seinsfrage, essentially. Oddly enough, and ironically enough, this form of life is unable to recognize the failure, I would claim, woven into the fabric of this very interrogation. In conclusion, then, I am not trying to reconcile the philosophical greatness of Heidegger's works with the contents of the Schwarze Hefte, nor could I. I'm not interested in rehabilitating Heidegger after the Schwarze Hefte, but rather in asking, how are we to do philosophy with or without or with and without Heidegger after having read these texts? Are we forced to overcome Heidegger once and for all? Or are we instead looking at recovering from Heidegger with Heidegger and with Heidegger's enactment of interrogative failure? Granted, Heidegger's destinal thinking and its transformative promise are somewhat responsible for his political deeds and for many of the more distasteful remarks found in the Schwarze Hefte, although I would stop short of reducing the Seinsfrage to the Judenfrage, or to an exclusive allergy to it, although I'm still oscillating on that. That's going to be my claim so far. Uh, mainly because the targets of his critique are the diverse expressions of metaphysical thinking, of which Judaism is one expression. I don't want to say but one expression. is one expression. And an infrequently, although we don't go down the route of counting the number of references, um, and infrequently refer to expression at that. I say this even though Heidegger's reprehensible attack on Husserl and the Schwarze Hefte as an example of this race who are unable to attain essential decisions with regard to the ontological question troubles me deeply. These are not the words of friendship and admiration um, and betray yet again the dedication found in being in time. And yet there's nothing new there. There's nothing new here. And Heidegger's words were frequently barbed, frequently empty, and the tone of the Schwarze Hefte is by and large bitter and exasperated and far from searching. The language of Verfustung, Verüdung, Entwurzelung, Zerstörung is ubiquitous and is bound up with Heidegger's obdurate narrative of the abandonment of being, which has been unleashed most acutely in the form of power and machination in the face of what neither has measure nor power. However, here Heidegger fails to meet his own hermeneutical demands outlined in the Schwarze Hefte that one must possess, he writes, 
the courage to track one's own presuppositions back to their ground and interrogate the goals one has set in advance. End quote. This he does not do. And his questionable claims, which are far from his own idealized, question-worthy questions, go unquestioned. And um, as uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard puts it, what we have is an interminable anamnesis going on. While both Junger and Heidegger may have thought that vulgar anti-Semitism was foolish and repulsive, both in their attempts to withdraw from the open space of public reasoning and insist on the fact that the universe affirms itself in a few rare individuals, and not that every individual is an illustration of the universal, causes both thinkers to miss the very concrete particularity and suffering of this or that person, which goes unnoticed in the unphilosophical abstraction that permits such phrases as these people, Semitic nomads, and this race. It is interesting to note that Leopold Schwarzschild's critique of Junger's 1930 essay on nationalism and the Jewish question could equally be leveled against Heidegger. Schwarzschild writes, and I think it, 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 it bears reflection, the exaltation of the strong and courageous few is predicated on forgetting the debasement of the many. The, the exaltation of the strong and courageous few is always predicated on forgetting the debasement of the many. Heidegger's philosophy is indeed engaged in a struggle with a totalizing universality, referring to it as a Platonistic tendency and setting it over against experiences such as the unique, the sudden, the unruly, barbaric principle. And yet all of a sudden, Heidegger's own interpretation of Judaism, and also I would say of Catholicism, it must be said, whose militaristic voluntarism, Jesuitical deviousness, and authoritarian spirit national socialism has become an extension of, illustrates the type of coarse generalizing tendency he continually warns us against. Perhaps it is from this perspective that we can start to talk about a, a metaphysical anti-Semitism that goes hand in hand with a Zeinsgeschichtlichen uh, uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, thank you for your attention. For in discussion. <laughs> and it's my pleasure to introduce to you the second speaker this morning, which is Professor Mahan O'Brien, who comes to us from the University of Sussex who has published a book, Heidegger and Authenticity, and is currently finishing a second book on Heidegger entitled Heidegger History and the Holocaust. And he will speak to us today on a paper called The Authentic Dasein of the People. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you very much for the organizing, for the invitation. Um, as I heard Nick reading out the title of the second book, I have a panic attack every time I realize that I tried to change it a few times and the publishers would accept me. Um, but some of what I'm going to say here today is related to some of the things in that book. Closer? Oh, yeah, okay. All right. Anyway, I'm going to begin with a quote from 1917. Um, and hopefully by the end of what I'm going to say, it'll, it'll make sense why I, I decided to use this particular quote. Um, okay, it's a, it's a letter to his wife, Elfrida, and people who, who know me. Probably sick of hearing this quote because every time I give a paper in Heidegger, I seem to start with this one. Um, and he writes, I cannot accept Husserl's phenomenology as a final position, even if it joins up with philosophy, because in its approach and accordingly in its goal, it is too narrow and bloodless, and because such an approach cannot be made absolute. Life is too rich and too great. Thus, for relativities that seek to come close to its meaning, that of the absolute, in the form of philosophical systems, it's a question of discovering the liberating path in an absolute articulation of relativity. The implacable necessity of a comparable enga engagement cannot be evaded today. Since I've been lecturing up to now, I've constantly experienced these sudden reversals until historical man came to me in a flash this winter. Okay. So as we can see, Heidegger conceives as a young man um, that his major breakthrough is the notion of historical man. And for better or worse, in a very famous exchange with Karl Lovath in Rome in the 1930s, um, Lovath reports that he confirmed that his notion of historicity in being and time stands as the philosophical underpinning um, for his commitment to National Socialism. And this is a, a quote from, from Lovath. I turned the conversation to the controversy in the Neue Zurich Zeitung and explained to him that I agreed neither with Barth's political attack 
Norwich Tigers defense, insofar as I was of the opinion that his partisan for National Socialism lay in the essence of his philosophy. Heidegger agreed without reservation and added that his concept of historicity was the basis of his political engagement. So, after being in time, Heidegger had attempted to expand on his notion of authenticity and related notions such as historicity and makes references to the authentic or historical Dasein of a people in various works. And he discusses this possibility, the notion of an authentic Dasein of a people, along structurally consistent lines to the ones we find in the accounts concerning authenticity, inauthenticity, and solicitude or Fursorge in being in time. So we have a couple of challenges. First, we'll look at how Heidegger's notion of Fursorge or solicitude is relevant to his account of authenticity before then asking whether the same difficulties, which appear to complicate the initial account of authenticity, are going to trouble the idea or notion of an authentic Dasein of a people. And ultimately, we may end up diagnosing Heidegger's political myopia in the 30s as a consequence of an underlying inability to come to terms with that same tension he articulates in 1917. I think he attempts to resolve that tension at the expense of universalism and in favor of the relative or the provincial, but in a way that I don't think his own thought actually permits. So in section 26 of Being in Time, Heidegger discusses the notion of solicitude and the related notions of leaping in or leaping ahead of, vorspringen or vorausspringen. Now Heidegger at this point of being in time wants to know what kind of identities we have ordinarily prior to any abstraction when we're immersed and thrown into the world around us. And his answer basically relates to the compound structure he's been examining, namely being in the world. Now Heidegger has argued that we live in an equipmental, project-oriented world, and in looking to describe the identity of this, everyday, busy, project, preoccupied Dasein, he suggests that already within this network of significations of our mentally oriented world, sort of get it, we, there's a clue. And he writes, in our description of that environment which is closest to us, the work world of the craftsman, for example, the outcome was that along with the equipment to be found when one is at work, those others for whom the work is destined are encountered too. If this is ready to hand, then there lies in the kind of being which belongs to it, that is, in its involvement, an essential assignment or reference to possible wearers, for instance, for whom it should be cut to the figure. Not only that, he characterizes our interaction with others as a liberating activity. We free these entities which are like us insofar as they are in the world, very much as we are when we encounter them. Heidegger observes, however, that when we first begin to consider our interaction with others, we seem to be automatically oriented by our own Dasein, but he still wants to obviate any concerns that he's sponsoring solipsism. He argues rather that we never in fact come across others as occurrent objects present at hand, nor do we identify the other as the distinct pole to oneself. He argues rather that our most immediate, typical experience of ourselves takes place within our involved, project-oriented deportment as part of a group. In characterizing how we typically interact with others, Okay. Like that? Okay. How did you do it so well? That's how I did mine. Okay. So, in characterizing how we typically interact with others, we find that Heidegger resorts to a highly inclusive account of human existence. Heidegger characterizes our concernful dealings with others as Fursorge, solicitude. And having introduced this notion of solicitude with respect to the manner in which we interact with and experience other people, he considers the various ways that that concern for or solicitude can manifest itself, namely as leaping in for another person or to leap ahead of them. So what does it mean to leap in for another person? Well, in a way, it's to deny the other their own most possibility, their freedom toward their ultimate horizon or finitude, and thus a curtailment of their freedom. It is a way of dealing with another person that reflects a closing off of their authentic horizon with its temporal hue and to treat them in such a way as to conceal their innate potential. In Heidegger's more general sense of authenticity and inauthenticity, to leap in for would be to either usurp someone else's horizons and keep them locked within an existence characterized as continuous presence, or else to leap ahead of and to see another person as similarly claimed and thus bounded by an horizon of finitude in their own right thereby freeing the other for their own being toward death and recognizing in the other the same latent temporality 
which is constitutive of my own capacity to exist interpretively. If the notion of intersubjectivity, that is authentic intersubjectivity, were something that Heidegger wanted to expressly develop in being and time, then there is in section 26 enough to suggest that it is something that would be cashed out in terms of leaping ahead of another in an authentic relationship based on a reciprocal recognition of two people's mutual finitude. Even Dasein's most non-relational non experience of its own finitude, which has a singularly individuating effect, cannot ultimately suppress its interconnectedness. No matter how far from the world of our everyday concern seems to recede from us during such an experience, we are still ultimately beings that are only insofar as we are in the world. And to be in the world means to be a Dasein that is only insofar as it is a being with. The only difference being that the light of our temporality is now refracted through those same structures of an everyday identity, which we never really escape. We can now experience that world we inhabit more authentically, and that means interpreting others more authentically as well. But none of this is the achievement of the isolated subject in any traditional sense. Rather, it is a possibility that is available to Dasein when it experiences itself as a throne projector. And this ultimately would or should function as the theoretical backdrop to an authentic Dasein of a people, which Heidegger glosses in section 74 of Being in Time with apparent structural consonants in some of his later work. That anyone who would express reservations over what appears to be a tendency at times towards solipsism in Heidegger's subsequent account of Being Towards Death, he might well rejoin that he has already acknowledged that the very capacity to feel alone is merely a condition of our structural sociality, or being with, if you like whereby we experience a deficiency on the basis of the way we are existentially ontologically constituted. But Heidegger yet maintains that the existential experience itself is characterized by a feeling of complete isolation and detachment. Clearly Heidegger believes that his concession to the effect that the very capacity for aloneness is only possible on the basis of our existential ontological constitution as being with is sufficient to forestall any solipsistic readings of his account of authenticity. Notwithstanding, the discussion of this authentic experience itself is characterized existentially as something that leaves us feeling radically isolated and alone. But while this experience can function as the backdrop to an account of something like genuine inter intersubjectivity, it is still a phenomenologically problematic account in some respects. Heidegger describes our confrontation with mortality as entirely individualizing, something utterly non-relational, unbezuglic un is the term he uses and seems in the end to suggest that we cannot access another person's death as a substitute theme in terms of analyzing that experience. He repeatedly affirms the exclusivity and non-relational character of death as a possibility for Dasein. He writes, The full existential ontological conception of death may now be defined as follows. Death, as the end of Dasein, is Dasein's own most possibility, non-relational, certain, and as such indefinite, not to be outstripped. Death is, as Dasein's end, in the being of this entity towards its end. Now, granted, our everyday way of dealing with that is very much in the mode of inauthenticity. We process everything in the mode of das man. It's not something which we entertain as a genuine possibility. Rather, death is something which is alien to us. Now, Heidegger, in looking to retrieve the individual's most fecund existential possibility, wants to diminish the world of delusional everydayness as much as possible, and this prompts an emphasis on a rather solitary, anxious non-relatedness. However, that leads to something of an ambiguity in Heidegger's account, since he can be seen to be suggesting that what he wants to reject or undermine is the formal structural notion of mitsein, which he characterized so positively earlier. And that, of course, cannot be what he means to achieve with his account of authenticity, which is presumably why he has to reintroduce all of these caveats concerning the irreducibly social character of Dasein's existential ontological constitution. What is crucial for Heidegger is the manner in which death as a possibility shapes our interpretive possibilities. It's formative at the most primordial fundamental levels, and this in turn is the clue needed for a fundamental ontology, which appreciates the concealed backdrop to all disclosure. As an offshoot of this, Heidegger glosses or gestures at the possibility of an authentic life and an authentic community, which would be based on the kind of authentic realization which is available to Dasein. We are individualized and socialized in the same stroke, in terms of authenticity, even if Heidegger hasn't quite formulated a terminology which captures this theoretical implication of his own account. He's clear at times that authentic being towards death is about rescuing the temporal backdrop to our interpretive existence from our immersion in the phony continuous presence of everydayness. 
as Dasein's own most possibility, not to be outstripped, anticipation of death is the experience that individualizes Dasein down to itself. But Heidegger cannot sever the structural ties to the others, who, even in the authentic Augenblick, we are never entirely removed from. Hence, Heidegger has to rescue the formal element of his account of the existential constitution of Dasein and reconcile it with the account of authenticity, while yet trying to maintain this notion of non-relationality. It becomes clear that Heidegger tries to link his account back up to the notion of solicitude in section 26, in particular his account of leaping ahead for another Dasein. And there's a kind of an equivocation in what he's doing. On the one hand, he writes that in the authentic Augenblick, all being with others will fail us. And yet he wants to maintain that if concern and solicitude fail us, this does not signify at all that these ways of Dasein have been cut off from its authentically being itself. As structures essential to Dasein's constitution, he writes, these have a share in conditioning the possibility of any existence whatsoever. And then again, he will insist that though death individualizes, it does so, quote, in such a manner that as the possibility which is not to be outstripped, it makes Dasein, as being with, have some understanding of the potentiality for being of others. In understanding the thrown nature of our own situation and the ultimate possibility which conditions every aspect of my interpretive existence, I simultaneously see those from whom I never normally detach myself as similarly claimed. But at the same time, this can almost read as a token gesture once he has gone almost too far in another direction. Uh, another quote, we may now summarize our characterization of authentic being towards death as we have projected it existentially. Anticipation reveals to Dasein its lostness in the day in the day self and brings it face to face with the possibility of being itself primarily unsupported by concernful solicitude. So Heidegger is emphatic that Dasein is existentially ontologically a being with. He offers a richly inclusive account of the sociality of our existence and the authentic possibilities available in terms of engaging with others as finite transcendences in their own right in the mode of leaping ahead. However, Dasein always and for the most part is such that it has surrendered its identity to an inauthentic, anonymous group identity which he refers to as Dasman. And in the move to authenticity, Heidegger describes how an awareness of our ineluctable finitude can rescue us from our lostness in the collective, indistinct, anonymous identity of everydayness. However, in doing so, Heidegger seems to privilege the notion of the intensely private, non-relational self which he has gone to considerable lengths to deconstruct as phenomenologically inappropriate. And in a way, this is already indicative of a struggle at the heart of Heidegger's thought in terms of the tension between the absolute and the relative or the universal and the immediate and is replicated, I believe, in his disastrous attempt to gesture at an alternative political vision to modernity's universalizing aims in a valorization of the provincial and the local in a way which is as unwarranted as the rhetoric of non-relationality is the project of being in time. The conditions which allow Dasein to become an individual are universal. Their instantiation issues in an immediate historical context, but the conditions which shape that event are in a way absolute and are simultaneously the conditions for the possibility of mutual recognition. This is something which Heidegger had already gestured at in his letter to Elfrida in 1917, but it's a problem whose complexity he underestimates in the late 20s and early 30s. So, given that Heidegger argues that human beings can be, uh, if you like, intersubjectively authentic, how are we to understand his account of the authentic historical community? And can it be, rec can it be reconciled with the foundations we've unpacked upon which it would have to be based? Heidegger certainly seems to suggest the times that his philosophy circumscribes the conditions for the authentic realization of an historical people, an authentic Dasein of a people. We find claims to that effect in the opening chapter of Introduction to Metaphysics, for example. How then does an authentic historical community come about, and is there, in fact, any sense in which it can be thought to sanction the level of exclusion and provincialism which Heidegger felt justified in championing in the early 30s? Section 74 of Being in Time has come in for renewed scrutiny in the last couple of decades, as the extent of Heidegger's commitment to National Socialism has become more widely known. And though the section has caused a, a degree of unrest, I would argue that it's very much in line with the manner in which Heidegger seemed to recommend an extrapolation from his account of authentic Dasein to something like an authentic Dasein of a people, an idea which he'd lost in subsequent texts from the 1930s. So Heidegger had earlier discussed the manner in which Dasein could exist authentically through anticipatory resoluteness, 
resolving in this way allows Dasein to rescue itself from a complete immersion in a superficial, public, dispersed existence. And he, he now pushes this idea further and returns to an aspect of our thrownness, Gewerfenheit, which he wants to develop, namely that we're thrown into an historical situation, which means that we inherit all manner of beliefs, mores, and so on. He now refers to this as something that is handed down to us, our heritage. He links this idea to the account of fallen everydayness, which he had earlier unpacked. So as someone thrown into a particular historical period in a particular community with its own series of customs and conventions, its own identity, I am someone who more or less unwittingly has acquired a heritage. In other words, many aspects of the way the world is revealed to me, and which I in turn project as part of my supposedly neutral understanding, have been handed down to me. As Heidegger argues, when we pay attention to the way we exist as finite creatures towards death in the world around us, we begin to reflect on, on that world and see it in new ways. What we haven't necessarily seen is the hidden, he says, handing down to oneself of the possibilities that have come down to one. He further tries to expand on the structural features of being with, which we examined earlier in our discussion of section 26. Um, and he writes, If Dasein, by anticipation, lets death become powerful in itself, then as free for death, Dasein understands itself in its own superior power, the power of its finite freedom, so that in this freedom, which is only in its having chosen to make such a choice, it can take over the powerlessness of abandonment to its having done so, and can thus come to have a clear vision for the accidents of the situation that has been disclosed. But if fateful Dasein, as being in the world, exists essentially in being with others, its historizing is a co-historizing and is determinate, determinative for it as destiny. This is how we designate the historizing of the community of a people. Destiny is not something that puts itself together out of individual fates any more than being with one another can be conceived as the occurring together of several subjects. Our fates already have already been guided in advance in our being with one another in the same world in an, and in our resoluteness for definite possibilities. Only in communicating and in struggling does the power of destiny become free. Dasein's fateful destiny in and with its generation goes to make up the full authentic historizing of Dasein. So Heidegger is folding together the idea of the structural constitution of Dasein as a being with and the fact of our thrownness, insofar as that we're thrown into a shared existential situation, with not just the structural backdrop of our tempor temporality, but the cultural, political, and historical heritage which has been shaped by that temporalizing process, and through which we see ourselves, crucially, as having something like a shared destiny. And we can clearly see how Heidegger is opening up his analysis and making it available for a political interpretation here. But there seems to be nothing within this thought to suggest that we can include some but exclude others from this shared heritage. If it's a question of living in the same place and belonging to the same community at the same time, then unless one wants to invoke ethnic differences as somehow significant in terms of becoming an authentic historical people, it would seem that anyone should be afforded a place within this notion of an authentic community. So Heidegger clearly wants to map his account of authenticity, which times appears to be discussed in relation to an individu individual Dasein, onto some proto-community which would be bounded by a shared destiny and faith. Only if Dasein has become authentic can it exist in the mode of faith. Only then can it be historical in the very depths of its existence. In coming to terms with our finite transcendence, we are able to become genuinely historical and thus to see ourselves as coming from a possibility of existence that has come down to us. Heidegger elaborates then on what it might mean for Dasein to live authentically as an historical Dasein within a shared historical context where coming to terms with one's thrownness involves taking up the possibilities that have been handed down to us. Seeing how we are thrown into and thus shaped and determined by our heritage, how a tradition is handed down to us, all of which occurs under the limiting condition of our finitude, is crucial to existing authentically such that we can contribute to and share in an authentic community. So Heidegger appears to confirm the interpretation we volunteered earlier to the effect that the notion of authentic Dasein, understood as existing in a particular mode for the Dasein that is in the world, and as such Dasein as Mitsein, stands as the kind of individually realized version, though always already Mitsein, of authenticity, which is structurally replicated at the collective level of the people. And here again we face the problems we mentioned earlier, insofar as it is not at all clear that the conditions which lead to authentic existence, and indeed coexistence, as part of a people, are anything other than transcendental conditions for the possibility of authentic coexistence and recognition. 
Nothing within this account warrants the preference for one tradition or heritage over another, as though that preference was grounded in something that involved qualitative differences between people or communities. By the time we get to the, this infamous 1933-34 seminar, Nature History State, there's really not much doubt anymore about the rather deeply disturbing political currents that are actually flowing under some of these ideas. Heidegger offers a cursory overview of his conception of time and temporality during the course of one of the seminars, right before he explicitly turns to the question of the state. So he's already, I'm, I'm not going to read out the quote, but he's, he's already sort of returning to his own notion of time and temporality as, as very, very crucial and relevant to his seminars. He, and he ends that particular passage with the claim, um, I'll, I'll read it, only an entity whose being is time can have and make history. An animal has no history. So Heidegger begins to link this notion of historical human beings as a people to the notion of the state he wants to champion, and in this context he begins to weave the term Volk into his discussion. However, we can clearly see that Heidegger is revisiting the manner in which he had begun to develop these ideas and being in time, insisting that he's not thinking here of time as a framework, rather he's thinking of human temporality and thus alluding to his account of authenticity. In thinking of history, then, he is quick to note that he is not thinking of dates or chronology, but rather in terms of time understood as the authentic, fundamental constitution of human beings. It is only as such an entity that we can be thought to be historical in the sense that Heidegger is trying to convey. After all, only an entity whose being is time can have and make history. And it is in terms of our authentic historical nature as throne daseins that Heidegger believes we should begin to think of our capacity to belong to a state. We can see clearly enough now why Heidegger would have insisted to Lovett in the mid-1930s that his political views were derived from his notion of historicity. Heidegger now begins to think of his, this collective Dasein of a people, that is the notion of historical Dasein, writ large as the authentic Dasein of a people in terms of Volk. As he begins to expand on the notion of Volk, we can hear distinct echoes of some of the ideas he was beginning to develop in section 74 of Being in Time. Um, I'll, I'll read out part of a quote. He writes, And with this we come to the entity that belongs to the state, its substance, its supporting ground, the people, das Volk, but closely related to this is a term such as public health, health Volksgesundheit, in which one now also feels the tie of the unity of blood and stock, the race. But in the most comprehensive sense, we use the term Volk when we speak of something like the people in arms. With this we mean nothing merely like those who receive draft notices, and also something other than the mere sum of the citizens of the state. We mean something even more strongly binding than race and a community of the same stock, namely the nation. And that means a kind of being that has grown under a common fate and taken distinctive shape within a single state. So Heidegger on the one hand appears to have accepted the importance of notions of blood, stock, and race in terms of the state and the people, which is the supporting ground of the state, but again he wants to move away from the straightforward Nazi principles with which those terms would be associated. Heidegger then avoids straightforward biological racism, but that is not to say that he eschews any or all forms of racism, rather he opts for a rather different kind. Some want to call it metaphysical, some call it spiritual. I just think it's a form of racism, whatever it is. He insists that he means something more than simply the bind that ties together race and the community of the same stock. Rather, what he has in mind is the nation, and the nation is to be understood as a kind of being that has grown under a common fate and taken distinctive shape within a single state. In other words, a nation for him means the kind of authentic Dasein of a people which is the authentic or true community which he gestures at in being in time and looks to elaborate on subsequently. Not only that, Heidegger is now prepared to openly avow that not every people has such a state. That is to say, in a way that not every people can be or is an authentic people. He writes, the people that turns down a state that is stateless has just not found the gathering of its essence yet. It still lacks the composure and force to be committed to its fate as a people. I, he goes on to explain that a homeland is not yet a state. He says the homeland becomes the way of being of a people only when the homeland becomes expansive, when it interacts with the outside. Um, and interestingly, a little bit further on in that passage, he says, this is also the great problem of those Germans who live outside the borders of the Reich. They do have a German homeland, but they do not belong to the state of the Germans, the Reich. So they are deprived of their authentic way of being. In summary, then, we can say that the space of a people, the soil of a people, 
reaches as far as the members of this people have found a homeland and have become rooted in the soil, and that the space of the state, the territory, finds its borders by interacting, by working out into the wider expanse. And in probably the most incriminating passage of all, Heidegger dispatches altogether with the claims to collective authenticity for Slavic and Semitic nomadic peoples. He writes, for a Slavic people, the nature of our German space would definitely be revealed differently from the way it is revealed to us, to Semitic nobads. It will, never, it will perhaps never be revealed at all. This way of being embedded in a people, situated in a people, this original participation in the knowledge of the people cannot be taught. At most, it can be awakened from its slumber. So there's no denying that he's willing to profess views that were certainly rather worrisome. Um, and on this, I mean, I think we really do have to avoid the temptation to act as an apologist. Heidegger clearly privileges in a number of texts a particular conception of the German people as the most authentic people. And this conception in this particular context has unmistakable and at times explicit ethnic connotations, even if they appear to be more than merely biological. When we consider how Heidegger was to underwrite the specific vocation of the German people as the most metaphysical of all peoples in texts such as Introduction to Metaphysics, but in another text as well, we have to call it into question rather than looking to make apologies for it. Heidegger very clearly states, after all, that to be German in some kind of authentic manner doesn't even necessarily involve living within the borders of the state. Okay, I'm just going to wrap up with a few concluding pages. Take me about two minutes. Um, I just want to jump ahead to comments that Heidegger makes during the Bremen lectures in 1949. Um, he provocati provocatively notes, um, and he makes the infamous agriculture remark during the same series of lectures, that the victims in the death camps did not die, that their death had been denied them. The implication would appear to be that their capacity to be towards death was denied to them, and as such we can understand them as being disposed of in a way which suppressed the most important wellsprings of a shared humanity. But this interpretation necessitates a concession to the absolute universal nature of notions such as our historicity, which are unavailable to the localizing move that Heidegger sometimes tries to make. In a lecture entitled Die Gefahr, the danger, he proclaims, hundreds of thousands die in masses. Do they die? They perish. They are put down. Do they die? They become pieces of inventory of a standing reserve for the fabrication of corpses. Do they die? They are unobtrusively liquidated in annihilation camps, and even apart from such as these, millions now in China abjectly die in starvation. To die, however, means to carry out death in its essence. To be able to die means to be capable of carrying this out. We are only capable of, of it, however, when our essence is endeared to the essence of death. But what else is Heidegger invoking here if not the absolute precondition for any sense of authentic community, regardless of historical specificity? What else do we have here but the articulation of historical re relativity or immediacy, which can ground an individual and in a community, but which is in a way universal, absolute? Heidegger is alluding here to one of his formulations of authentic human freedom. We are inescapably finite creatures, and this is the horizon against which the world is effectively constituted for us. To be for Dasein means to be temporal. It is the ultimate delimiting condition for our interpretive understanding. This horizon is an horizon of possibility, according to Heidegger, and we are to understand our freedom in this light. Precisely what was stolen or denied the Jewish community by the perpetrators of the Holocaust, we can infer from Heidegger's remark, is their freedom, freedom so understood, their possibilities understood against the backdrop of a temporal horizon. Their possibility and future impossibility were taken away from them. Their horizon as a community was expunged, and they were plunged as existing creatures into a hell without horizons. Okay. So, deprived then of the spiritual oxygen upon which our capacity to entertain hope relies to experience ourselves as historical beings, to anticipate and commemorate, to be creatures with a past and a future, those that were murdered in the death camps were rendered docile creatures, like ruminants, rambling aimlessly towards slaughter. In a way, their execution had been carried out much earlier, long before they reached the gas chambers. For Heidegger then, the Jews in the death camps, for example, by and large did not die, they were put to death. But they had already lost sight of their horizon and thus were rendered dead long before they gasped for a last breath in the gas chambers. Their freedom toward death and thus their capacity to exist 
as free human beings and as an authentic community had been stripped from them. And in a sense, Heidegger is reinforcing here the absolute nature of the conditions which render any community relative or local or historical. Heidegger is convinced that this temporal backdrop to our interpretive awareness, our historicity, is crucial to any sense of living authentically and is constitutive of both our authentic and inauthentic existence. Alas, Heidegger is unable to see that this consequence of his own thought points to the extreme danger of privileging the historical instantiation of one community over another on the basis of conditions which, as he had already seen in 1917, are in a way absolute. Such a move is ultimately arbitrary, and where Heidegger's mature thought seems to shy away, although even, even though uh, in the later stuff it's um, a little bit ambiguous sometimes as well, even though his later thought seems to shy away from it, um, he was at one point determined to justify such a move, justify it in such a way that leads to a gross inconsistency in his own thought. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very fine paper. Um, and we have a few minutes for questions and comments. Dan? Dan? Hi. Um, thank you. The, um, the talk of generation in, in being in time. Um, in the talk of time, you say uh, history pre presupposes that we are temporal. Uh, is it possible that already at work there is the opposite, that time presupposes history, and history is always uh, a time space? And so it's the, it's the place of the generation. It's the, it's the German people that's already at work uh, in his thinking there. I mean, you're quite right that it's... Uh, way of talking transcendentally and being in time. There's a claim to universality there. But when he moves to the talk of the tradition recovering the era, um, it, it certainly sounds like it's not just a, it's a, a place to time. Uh, I could ask you a follow-up, if you'd like, uh, is in the Beiträge when he talks about uh, Zeitraum, uh, is that uh, also an appeal to the notion that we can't have a time without a place? I'm, I mean, I think there's a, a, a few different things that are... I mean, there's a sense in which that's obviously right. Um, what worries me is the way he tries to privilege that space because it seems to me that, again, you could put that into a rather... You know, this particular space is particular to this place, but the way the whole thing works very, very dangerous the moment you go down the road, I think, of saying the way that's happening in this particular place is somehow going to be automatically more authentic. Because it, it seems that what you're describing is a, a, a dynamic or, or, or a series of conditions that have to obtain for things to become meaningful or authentic in the way that they do. Now, the, the moment you try and privilege one version of that, um, which is not to say that, I, I mean, so you could very well make the case, well, look, I'm not trying to privilege, but I have to do it from the tradition that I come from. That, that would be hermeneutically honest, I think. But to say, to, to invest into it all of this other stuff and to, to then try, it, try to articulate a political philosophy, I mean, albeit slightly different from existing or historical national socialism, um, but to articulate your own political philosophy that is going to be a kind of provincialism in a way, that, I think that's very dangerous. But I, I, I mean, theoretically, I think your point is absolutely right, yes. Tony? Yeah, yeah. Um, when your last comment about uh, the, uh, the, 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 the context in which one dies and, for example, one perishes instead of dying, almost seems to redeem Heidegger in certain respects in relationship, for example, to that earlier comment in the question concerning technology, which he identifies uh, the um, motorized food industry and the corpse, production of the corpse in the gas chambers. And, and you know, you think, okay, okay, this last comment might redeem him. But just on reflection, it's, it's, it almost seems somewhat false, too, because that almost equates 
a being toward death with a will toward death, or a willing death, and that you can will your own context of death. And precisely the point is not that. So I don't really think it's, I, I don't know what you think about that. I, at first I thought, oh, you know, it's sensitive. But on the other hand, I think it's really misleading and rather false to say one simply perishes. It, one simply perishes from the, um, from the per people who are perpetrating the death, and not from the per people who are experiencing the death. There's still a being toward death in that, and there's still this possible authentic dying. So it seems rather false to me, and I don't know what, if you feel that way too, or seem yeah, to it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not particularly concerned as to whether or not um, anyone would derive a huge amount of consolation from Heidegger's remarks. Um, the point I'm trying to make is that he is actually trying to use resources from within his own thought on the one hand, to condemn what happened to people in death camps, and that's precisely the same, the, the same theoretical underpinnings he's trying to use to articulate a polit political philosophy in somewhere else. Um, and it seems to me that at least the attempt, regardless of how, how miserable or impoverished it is, to condemn what went on in the camps is, is much closer to the theoretical stuff happening in, in being in time that he's trying to use in the 30s, actually. Uh, that was more the point, really. Um, I mean, I, I, think, I think there is something to the idea that, that in the attempt to dehumanize, if, if, so for example, if you're a Heideggerian, if you think this idea of being towards death, not in some sort of sense of immediacy, uh, immediacy but in terms of an interpretive horizon, um, I, I think there's something to the idea that, that if that's a fundamental component of what it means to be human, or Heidegger it clearly is, then to dehumanize would be to take away or to deny or suppress that very condition. I, of course, accept that you could argue that there's a, a very, very intense sort of nothing sharpens the mind so much as execution and the dawn <laughs> being towards death that's happening as well, but I, I think that's a slightly different question. And one final question, please. Um, a very an, an interesting expression that um, Community of the same stock. So you, you seem to imply that it's very typical uh, of the Germans. You, you mentioned the case of the Volksdeutsche, the Germans living abroad. And it's not the French conception, it's not the Italian conception, but many other countries have the same conception. Swede, Swede, Sweden has the same conception. And last but not least, the state of Israel has exactly the same conception. And, 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 and Irish. Yeah, yeah, and and it's a very strong sense, but but but, 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 but it seems to be, you know, um, a, a reproach, you know, and uh, and a typically Nazi. And just one remark: the, the state of Israel has exactly the same conception, and the constitution of the state of Israel has been written after a, a very very bad guy, Karl Schmidt. And uh, you know, it's uh, and it's a bit confusion, but you know, who is good, who is bad. Uh, so, so, but, but, but no, was that, we'll let Mahan answer. We'll, we'll, let, but. Anyway, so Mahan, please. I, to, to the sort of more theoretical, or not theoretical, but to, to the earlier point, um, I don't think there's a problem with, uh, you know, necessarily people sort of having a sense of diaspora or that we've got our peoples everywhere or anything like that. Uh, what I, I mean, uh, it'd be interesting to see what people would think about how far one would go with those notions. Um, I mean, is it as important as just feeling that you're following a football team? But this is the important thing. Um, why would you exclude some people from, why would you exclude some people that actually are living in that country? That's, that's what I'd have a problem with. And Heidegger, in his own way, thinks that certain people, for at times just explicitly ethnic reasons, don't qualify as Germans. And, and he, he, I mean, it's not just an accident of history. I mean, he's, he's, unless he's a complete idiot, and I, I don't think he, I don't, no, but I, I don't think he's a complete idiot. He's, he's, he's saying this stuff in the middle 30s when he knew exactly what he was saying. No, no, but in a way, that sort of saying is like, well, look, lots of other people have done bad things too. <laughs> I mean, that's not a defense. I mean, what we're examining is whether or not there are politically problematic components in Heidegger's thought. Um, I think he's not able to articulate a political philosophy consistently. 
because I think his thought ends up being too sophisticated for that. But we, we have to take the stuff he says seriously. It, it's very worrisome. Same stock in, 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 yeah, saying that in 1930, if you're, if, no, no, but if you're the Nazi, if you're the Nazi rector of Freiburg University in 1933 and you say things like community of the same stock, blood stock, race, Semitic nomads can't be here uh, or, or uh, can't belong to this, I think that's problematic, yes. And I can also invite you to continue the discussion in the short pause that will take a five minute pause before our third speaker, but before we begin the pause, let us thank once again Mahan for this very stimulating paper. Thank you.